So it's, it's indeed a major revamping, a departure on what we are doing today. Welcome to Staff Talk, uh, the UN Internet ISIC radio series. I'm Helga Liefstetter in New York, and today I have a very special guest with me, our distinguished Assistant Secretary General, Director of Umocha, Mr. Ernesto Baca. Uh, Mr. Baca, welcome to our program today. Thank you very much, Elia. I'm very honored and I really appreciate your invitation. So my first question to you is, since 2012, how would you describe this journey? And what did you mean when saying transforming our way of doing business? And how would that fit into the overall vision of this very large project? It is becoming a very, very interesting journey. I think that we are moving at a very good pace right now with a lot of traction coming from every site in the Secretariat. It's not an, just an IT project, it's a true business transformation project. And everybody is dreaming on the day that we are going to devote more of our attention and our resources to our core mandates and less to the manual workload that we have to do, uh, doing uh, clerical activities that are very demanding in time and distracting our management from, from the real issues. When you say that it's in fact not an IT project, which uh, it's a project that transforms workflows and processes and has impact on staff, therefore. Uh, but in the beginning, people felt sometimes that it was maybe as a software, really, or because it's an enterprise resource planning system. And so you are saying that it is, in fact, everything except really technology, although it is including technology. It's more workflows and processes. Is that what you feel? Indeed. This is workflow processes, the way that we are structured in the organization. There are tasks that are going to disappear, tasks that are going to be managed on a global perspective, tasks that are going to be managed on a regional context, and, and tasks that are going to be performed in the deep field. Uh, things that are going today uh, in, in back offices are going to be managed at the front end by using uh, cell service portals for, and we are going to touch the life of more than 100,000 colleagues across the whole world. So it's, it's indeed a major revamping, a departure on what we are doing today. So what is the impact on staff at large when you use self-service? What does that mean? If we have to ask for a day off or we want to travel or we want to tell the organization that they had a, a new daughter or a new son and you have to look for the entitlements. What we are going to do is to open our laptops and we are going to enter the information straight that right there as opposed to filling a form or passing that to another back office that is going to take care of that. So everything that is related to what has to be done with my personal life vis-a-vis -vis the organization is going to be dealt through a portal as early as June this year. So, in fact, what you're saying is that staff has to not only understand that it's going to have an impact on just the workflows in terms of being it finance and budget or human resources or procurement and supply chain, it has to has a, a deep sort of, as you say, social uh, change in terms of how I behave or how you behave towards your intimate information, in fact. Probably the best way to, uh, to, to show the different paradigms that we're going to embrace is that time and attendance. That's something that is today very demanding in terms of support, and we are asking all of us and what time we got in and what time we are going to get out. The paradigm and the rumors is different is I am going, going to report only the exceptions. If I am not going to come, I'm going to report. So that means appealing to the maturity of the, our colleagues, appealing to the way that managers run their offices. It's a grown-up organization that's starting to play what other organizations are doing. Trust in the staff. Uh, the staff in counterpart has to be up to the challenge of reporting exceptions whenever they are not going to come to the office for any 
justified reason, or even unjustified. Uh, so it's a very, very different dynamic what we're going to see once we implement to Moja as compared to what we have today. It sounds almost like it's going to shift the cultures because there are various cultures in the organization. There are headquarters cultures, there are field cultures and deep field cultures, but all of them will somehow have to shift. The cultures will be different. That's a very, very interesting point and right on. I think, Elga, that what we are going to see moving forward is little by little building a culture at the UN Secretariat level. Let's face it, today we are very proud of the organization we work, but we are like a conglomerate of different cultures depending on where you work. If you are in OCHA, uh, coordinating emergencies, humanitarian emergencies, or you are in peacekeeping, we managed to develop a culture on each and one of those sites that we are very proud of what is being done, but uh, there is not such a thing as the UN culture. So now what, what we are going to do is by harmonizing all what we are doing, combined with mobility, which is another initiative that runs parallel to Umoja, we are going to hit the ground running because if we are being transferred to a different place, we will not to have to relearn tricks or solutions or ways to do things there will be a common way of doing things, and that will enforce the idea of a one UN. We are a true UN with, their, with our own culture. When you talk about 100,000 people, who are included? I'm not even including in that, and uh, we should, because at a given point we are going to do it, the military personnel. But I'm talking about all the civilian categories that we have in the organization, in every shape and form, with every sort of contract. The military for us is the essential part also of uh, our mission. In fact, these are central to most of our operations in peacekeeping, but they are going to come in the next wave because then we will be talking about almost 180,000 colleagues altogether. That brings us a little bit to this question about um, the people, for example, in the field, because DFS uh, supported missions around the globe and have already implemented some Umocha functions. Can you tell us more about what Umocha is being used for and what are the plans for implementation in 2015? A lot of people believe that Umocha is still a project. Indeed, it's a project for half of this organization, but it's a reality, a day-to-day -day reality, for, I would say, 60% of our footprint is already being reached by Umocha. In fact, today is running and alive with good health in all the peacekeeping missions from the deep field to headquarters in all the special political missions and as a drag effect of that because we have to support that there are about 400 users in headquarters plus several other users in the hubs like Geneva, Nairobi, Entebbe, eh, Brindisi, Valencia, that are supporting those colleagues that already migrated. So they are doing and they are managing basically the end-to-end -end operations today by using Umoja. So for them, Umoja is no longer a project. It's a reality where How payroll is being managed through that. Okay. Eh, all the financial activities are being dealt through Moja, real estate, procurement, so uh, supply chain uh, in a good portion is being covered by Umoja. When you say 60% of the footprint, are we talking then about one of the modules and sort of in some there are the financial or payroll and some it's procurement. So it sort of has been distributed among them to to start with. Is that the case? The, the reason why I'm saying 60% is because if we put together all the resources we have in terms of staff in the Secretariat and sites, roughly we are covering now 60%. But you are also right that Umoja comes in different flavors. The first one is what we call Umoja Foundation, which covers the services or the the functions that I mentioned before, and then we have Umoja Extension 1 to be followed by Umoja Extension 2. Extension 1 is going to expand the functional footprint to go to all the way to human resources management, travel management, and completing the payroll solution in order to replace the myriad of 
applications that we have today. I see. And uh, and the UN headquarters in New York are supposed to be on these extensions as of this year, right? In June, we are going to have a deployment in all the Nairobi-based organizations, but I mean UNEP, Habitat, and UNON. And when I say Nairobi, I mean the whole UNEP, Habitat, and UNON, no matter where they are in the world. But this is what is being included in, in the June rollout, together with ESCAP in Bangkok and OCHA, all together, the whole organization being supported from Geneva and New York. It, they are going to roll out in June. And then in November comes the rest of the organization, meaning all the departments and offices that are being headquartered in New York, the ones in Vienna, all the rest of the economic commissions, the four of them that are besides ESCAP, and the tribunals around the world, and the training institutions, basically based in Europe. So all those are coming in live in November. It's a big, big quantity of colleagues and organizations that are going to be migrated. The sort of last question that I have to you at this point for staff is, can you summarize what the changes are for the UN staff? Uh, where can I learn about it? What's the best place for me to go and inform myself about it today? There is going to be an impact within all of us just for the sheer fact that, as I said, we are going to become users of the self-service portal. For those one doing transactions today, there is going to be an impact because there is there are a shift of responsibilities or tasks that are going to move eventually to one place to the other or plainly disappear. But at the very same time, there will be new functions that we have to play. So we will need business analysts, system uh, people that are going to dig in into the system and do data mining and trying to find, uh, to do more analytical work is one of the examples. The whether there will be a need for what we call local process experts and a lot of jargon that you can learn in umoja.un.org. But I would say that this solution is not aimed to eliminate jobs at all. There is not even a discussion in, at the member states level that we are expecting to eliminate jobs. What we are trying to perform here is to make a better use of our resources and to be sure that we devote our resources for more value-added tasks as opposed to do clerical work. Mm -hmm. We put together the Umoja Academy in order to build a cadre of staff that are going to be fully qualified to deal with this new way of working. So you can go also answering your question to the Inspira Learning Portal where you can start taking some online training classes. So we are not uh, underestimating at all the cost and the, the investment that we have to make in order to make our colleagues ready to cope with this new world. I thank you very much for coming here today to Staff Talk, uh, the UN Internet podcast. And uh, I wish you and your team and the entire organization success on this journey. And I hope to see you again. Uh, in the meantime, we will also invite other people that you may suggest to us, and we will also discuss with other staff members around the organization that may have something to share with us to enlighten us more and more on what is ahead of us in terms of Umocha.